Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second in our three-part series of Black History in Cleveland. This is our Leader Lunch Break Way Forward Workshop, and today's guest is Dr. John Grabowski. Dr. Grabowski is the go-to guy for anything you want to know about Cleveland history. He is the Krieger Mueller Associate Professor of Applied History at Case Western Reserve University, where he teaches courses in sports history, civil history, and public history. He is also the Senior Vice President for Research and Publications at the Western Reserve Historical Society. There, he has been dedicating his talents for 52 years, having started when he was six years old. He also edits the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History, the go-to book on Cleveland's past, and he launched this over 30 years ago. Dr. Grabowski spends his time prying into the past to unlock secrets held in writings, obscure documents, photos, and sometimes even receipts, and unlocks those secrets bringing to life the people who stand behind them. He delves not just to find out who they were, but where they were, what they did, and what motivated them. He is a lifelong Clevelander with family roots from Slovenia and Poland, and he deeply appreciates the need to understand the history of race in Northeast Ohio. An avid biker explorer and model shipbuilder, we're grateful to have the benefit of his insights with us today. Welcome, Dr. Grabowski. Thanks so much, Marianne, for that wonderful introduction. Um, sometimes I like to sail away on the model ships that I build, but uh, I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon, and I will be touching briefly upon Cleveland, but what I want to do is provide an overview of U.S. immigration policy over time and the way that race has affected it, shaped it, and continues to shape it. I think that ultimately affects Cleveland in terms of who can come to Cleveland, who can settle in Cleveland. It affects the entire United States. It's not a pretty story over time. Um, but it is a necessary story to be told. And it's not simply a story of black and white. It's a story of all shades and hues and how race has been constructed and used for or against various people over time. So let me begin with the PowerPoint. Uh, and the PowerPoint, I will, I will try to get through as quickly as possible. There are some images that I really want to, uh, to stick on for a while. So let me get my share screen up here and move this to, this is probably the wordiest title I've ever given to a presentation, but it's a history of the role of race in the construction of US immigration policy. And I think what we need to move on to is, is what people, some people expected of the United States or America when the settlement first began here and when it was created. So let me give you a, a few statements here. Thomas Paine, that old radical of the American Revolution, said Europe and not England is the parent country of America, and said that this new world hath been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. It's pretty Eurocentric. Herman Melville, later in the 19th century, said our ancestry is lost in the universal paternity. That's a far more inclusive statement. Joel Barlow, who was a poet of the American Revolution, said what Americans think is what Americans are. Now you can take that statement and cut it in a number of ways. And Jonathan Edwards in the colonial period looked at the new world as the glorious renovator of the world. So those are some statements that we see coming out of colonial times and at the birth of the United States, but those are statements from people. So we need to go to the founding document of the United States to begin to understand where we stand on immigration. And that becomes very interesting. The legal specifics in the Constitution and immigration, only, there are only several articles. So only natural born can be president, Article 2, Section 1. Years of citizenship for the House and the Senate are defined in Article 1, Section 2. And then in say, Article 1, Section 9, we are talking about race in the United States, and we're talking about the fact that the Constitution of the United States never specifically mentions race or slaves. It deals with it, it obfuscates it. Let me read you that quote, that article. 
That article reads, the migration and importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax of duty may be imposed on such importation, not excluding, not exceeding $10 from each person. So the slave trade would remain legal in the United States from the adoption of the Constitution until, 18, until 1808. And then lastly, the federal government can create a uniform law governing naturalization. That's Article 1, Section 7. That's all it says. That's all it says about immigration. So it's very plastic on that. And let me go to the next image. And this is something that Roger Daniels, who's done a wonderful book called Coming to America on American Immigration, has, has picked up. This is a picture from one of the plantations in South Carolina shortly after it had been liberated, quote unquote, by, by Union soldiers. Uh, this is near Hilton Head, if I'm not mistaken. And Daniels will claim that if we're looking at illegal, quote unquote, undocumented immigration, the fact that after 1808, slaves were still being illegally brought into uh, the United States. African, African people were still being brought into the United States. Now, some of you may know the story of the last slave ship called the Clotilda, which sailed in 1860 under a bet that the man could go out and buy slaves and bring them back. And it came back to the United States. And the colony that was started after the Civil War by those people knows their roots very, very strongly. So what we are looking at in 1790 is a nation that is more than 18% African in origin. 95% of those people are enslaved. So the question is, what happens with immigration after that? And this is where we'll go with the presentation. These are the naturalization laws that are passed in 1790. Now, naturalization is really important. There are two things I'm going to talk about today. One is who can come to the United States. And two, who in the United States can become a citizen. That's critically important. That's all about voting. It's all about rights, isn't it? So that's what we're gonna do, two threads here. So I'll read through this. Two years of residence, free white male. Can't apply to be naturalized. Of good character, oath to support the constitution, can be applied for in any court of law. Children of tw under 21 follow and assume uh, citizenship from the parents. Those who are born abroad get citizenship. Children of fathers who have citizenship but have who have never been resident are not eligible. So it's kind of wonky. The last one's kind of interesting. Prescribed individuals are barred from citizenship. Prescribed meaning legally problematic. That's a little door that opens up. So that's the first naturalization law. In 1795, uh, six years after the French Revolution has started, a new immigration law is passed. And this is under a federalist government. Residency is increased to five years. You have to declare your intent to become a citizen three years prior to application, and you have to renounce all previous allegiances and give up any titles of nobility. Now, this is one of the first instances where foreign events are beginning to influence naturalization and who comes to the United States. The French Revolution. And the French Revolution is greeted by the new republic in the United States by some people with joy initially and by the Federalists as an abhorrent regicide. And so it's the Federalists who are in power and they want to change the laws who come to, of people who come to the United States. So in 1798, when we have an ersatz war with France at sea, residency is increased to 14 years. Intent has to be declared five years prior to application. And all this is in the context of the very infamous Alien and Sedition Acts. People publishing statements deemed to be false and against the United States can be imprisoned. And in, in people who are in the United States from enemy states can be uh, either put in prison or sent back to where they are. The friends of those aliens called the Alien Friends Act can also be in prison put back sent back, if you will. So you're looking at controlling the borders here. In 1802, under the Jeffersonian government, the requirements go back to five years. So this, this is the beginning, a little bit of turmoil. Nobody is saying anything about who can actually come because of race or nationality at this point. And that's important, uh, because if we look ahead, citizenship could be limited 
but there were no real regulations governing who could enter the United States. And that's for most of the 19th century. And, and when you see that, the question we might ask is what about black Africans? Could, could they come? The question is, would they want to come to the United States, which was still a slave uh, power at that point? We don't have a strong record of black Africans coming. Indeed, initially, if we look at the numbers, this is an overview of numbers coming to the United States. 18, 1783 to 1815, just 250,000 people, the Napoleonic Wars are coming. There's not a good reason to come to the United States. Between 1820 and 1860, 5 million people. It's mostly European, almost all European except for Chinese coming into the West Coast for the gold rush. And that's where we're gonna to begin to see a real racial aspect to American immigration policy. The jump that we'll get to 1861 to 1924, 32 million people come. Now we will find people very interesting between 1925 and 1965, we'll talk about this. There are a series of quota laws that are passed, which are very racially biased. And when I meant racially biased, it gets into this discussion of race as what part of Europe you come from. And we'll get into that. Uh, and 1965 is when we liberalize our immigration law, 23 million, 200,000 come in between 1998 and 2020, 30 million. Now, if we know these periods in which we've lived, we've seen the way racial attitudes will color who can come in and who cannot come in. Religious attitudes will color who can come in and not come in. I will not trespass on contemporary politics to the extent I can keep my voice silent on that. The early challenges, the antebellum period, when you begin to get a lot of people who are not like the original people of the United States. In 1790, the bulk of people in the United States, white people, were people from the British Isles. There were Germans. Uh, there were some uh, Northern Irish who came here. There were some Swedes, but the bulk of the United States derived from what we would call Great Britain. What happens in that period after 1820 is migration change shift. You begin to get Irish coming in, and the Irish happen to be Catholic. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Germans coming in, well, the Germans do not speak English. There are Germans here already. And the Germans come in, they're multi-religious, if you will. Some are Protestant, some are Catholic, and, and others are agnostic. But the real fear is, and this gets to a contemporary issue, this is the American party, the Know Nothing Party, which flourished in the United States in the 1840s and early 1850s. Um, and basically, I'll read this to you, Native Americans beware of foreign influence. And what you probably may not see on the flag with the American Eagle is 21 years. And what the, what the uh, American party is advocating is that naturalization of newcomers can occur for only after 21 years of residency here. One state passes a law that extends the naturalization period for 50 years. Now, this is complex. It's not that we don't want the Catholic Irish. We need them to build roads. We, we need them to build railroads. We need them to do the digging. Uh, but what we don't want them to do is vote. And so what we're looking here, and if we're talking about voting rights now and how they are being constrained, this is what the American party was doing. It's what we'll continue to let the Irish in but we simply won't let them be naturalized so they could be voted, so they could vote. We'll get back into naturalization and voting a little bit later. So that's what's going on prior to the Civil War. By the time of the Civil War, about 14% of the United States is a foreign birth. Religion is a factor. Um, it's the first R in restriction. Religion, radicalism, and race. That's what governs American immigration policy. So this is the caricature of an Irish Catholic with a Catholic prelate carving up the Democratic Party in New York and, and selling it off to various bidders. So we begin to look at corrupt city politics that are associated with the Irish at this time. Uh, one can see, if one looks at the iconography of American immigration, all sorts of visual racial tropes for Jews, for Italians, for African-Americans, they continuously turn up in the newspapers. And so religion is a factor. The fear of Protestants, the fears of Protestants in the United States of Catholics 
date back to the Reformation. The fear that Catholics cannot be good Americans because they owe their allegiance to the Pope. Now think about that in terms of American history. We now have a Catholic president, Joe Biden. We've had one before. All the others have been Protestant. Major changes come to the United States after the Civil War. It's when America industrializes and cities like Cleveland really begin to industrialize. Let me give you some statistics about Cleveland. Cleveland goes from a community of about 40,000 people in 1850 to nearly 800,000 people in 1920. And if you looked at Cleveland in 1920, two thirds of that population was of foreign birth or foreign parentage. And another 35,000 people were African-American. So it is no longer New England. And driving that change is industrialization and pulling over people, pulling people from Europe to the gold fields in California is the chance to get wealthy in the United States. And for industrialists, immigrants are necessary. They can man the factories. The factory system that arises in the United States can take somebody who may have been a peasant on a farm, take somebody from the deep south moving up north and train them to work on an assembly line or a slaughterhouse line or a disassembly line. And so people no longer need to be highly skilled even though some of them came. And so the power for the industrialists was having these people who would work cheaply. Here's an immigrant. Andrew Carnegie, a Scotsman who came and made a fortune, and he gave it a value, uh, annual value to an immigrant to industry in the 1880s. He said, any immigrant is worth $1,500 to industry on an annual basis. That's a large sum of money. The U.S. Treasury Department valued immigrants or workers as $800. Now, I'm playing with something here. You know, do people come to the United States for jobs? Do we allow them in because they need freedom or do we allow them in simply because they can work in the factories and make us wealthy? I'll get to today. Uh, how many of you had vegetables for breakfast today? Who picked them? The other thing that's happening post-Civil War is quote unquote, the science of race and the division of the world in quote unquote logical categories defined by color, ability, and de defined by something called Bertillian measurements, the measurement of the head and the assumption of a brain capacity and the assignment then of characteristics to people of various races. What you're looking at here are two pages from an 1876 uh, geography book used in a public school in the United States. Uh, the picture to your left are people of the Caucasian race, an, Af Af an Afghan, an Abyssinian woman, an Anglo-American, a Circassian woman, uh, uh, a Hindu, and an Arab. So those are Aryan races. Okay, you, you know where I'm going with this. The picture from another page in that book is the barbarous state versus the enlightened state. And so we're looking at, and I'll read this text to you, different grades may be recognized in the barbarous state. Some savages, the natives of Australia, for instance, the diggers of Utah and the dirt eaters, dirt eaters of the Orinoco region lead a mere animal life subsisting on plants, roots, insects, and such natural products as they can gather without implements. This is what is being taught in the schools. There's a quote unquote science of race that's being created. And we'll get into some really nasty aspects of it. The other aspect that comes in with this, and this is ascribed to certain ethnic groups, is radicalism. After the Civil War, the United States is trying to sort out whether capitalism works or doesn't work. And there are philosophies brought in from Europe, anarchism, uh, socialism, that, that seem to be better policies. So in 1886 in Chicago, the group of police who were at a rally for an eight hour day are hit by a bomb thrown by anarchists. And the anarchists are all German. Uh, several of them are executed, some are sent to jail and later pardoned. So you have that coming in with the immigrants and often, often really ascribed to certain groups of immigrants, radical Germans and radical Jews. This is Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, uh, lovers and anarchists of the late 19th century. Uh, Goldman was for women's rights. She was an out, outright anarchist. 
a uh, very, very powerful speaker, eventually deported to the Soviet Union in 1919. Alexander Berkman, her lover, tried to assassinate Henry Clay Frick, the, uh, uh, the manager of the Carnegie Steel Company. He was in prison for that. So you get this image and, and you have the whole trope that goes with Jews. Now, were Jews a race or Jews a religion? And anti-Semitism in the United States begins to rise in the late 19th century. Now, all this time, African-Americans are seeing quote unquote liberation because of the 13th Amendment and the Civil War, citizenship because of the 14th War uh, Amendment and, and voting rights. But we're also beginning to see in this period, 1876, Jim Crow being reestablished in the South and racial policy beginning to be harder, even in liberal cities like Cleveland. Cleveland, which was a major stop on the Underground Railroad and had a free black population of 800 in 1860. As it begins to acquire more black residents in the late 19th century, it begins to racialize. It begins to segregate facilities. So you have that attitude that's Southern moving up into Cleveland. The important thing to remember about immigration is the fact that before 1882, the federal government did not regulate it. It was up to the states. It's a long, complex story as to why this happened. But most of the states, when a ship of immigrants came in, taxed the ship owner on a head tax for every immigrant, 50 cents or whatever, to offset the cost of taking care of the poor and indigent in their community. The U.S. Supreme Court eventually ruled that that was the governance of federal commerce, and that relate, that meant that the United States government needed to govern immigration. This is the first immigration port in New York City. It's called Castle Garden. So when the federal government finally takes control in 1882, we see things happening. We see restrictions coming in. Now, in 1883, Emma Lazarus, who was from an old Sephardic Jewish family, is watching uh, Jews fleeing the pogroms of, 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 of Russia coming into the United States. And she writes this very, very famous poem, which is associated now with the Statue of Liberty. I will read the whole thing to you. Probably know it very well. Not like the brazen Greek giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea wash, sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning. And it says, you know, give me your tour, your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the gold. It's a very hopeful poem, isn't it? I have another poem I'll show you in a few minutes. So when the government takes control, they pass a Chinese Exclusion Act. And we're going to get into detail on that in a few minutes. They also impose a rule that they, you cannot admit those likely to become a public charge. That is, people who are coming into the United States have to prove they have enough money to support themselves. And then in 1891, they banned polygamists and people with loathsome and contagious, dangerous, contagious diseases. Now, the polygamist trope is not against people who are religious or are, are Muslim. It's against Mormons. Because many Mormons are, be, are people are being converted to Mormonism in, in England and they're coming in. So there's an anti Mormon trope to this as well. You can see this from this uh, polygamist tree, and uh, this is from Judge Magazine. So we're beginning to get a little closure here. But let's look at the Chinese. Why were they banned? They began to come in 1850 out of Canton in China, large numbers, like people from all over the world to the gold fields of California. And eventually they became pariahs in California. The statements were A, they were not Christian, B, that, in, that no American could work for the wages that Chinamen uh, could live on, and C, they, they, they had opium dens, and B, and, and D, if you will, their women were all loose and prostitutes. And so the white working men, quote unquote, of California got together in the sand lots that were led by a man named Dennis Kearney. Interesting, Dennis Kearney was Irish background. People on the East Coast would have felt that he was not of the right race. He was an Anglo-Saxon, but he became a white man when he went to California and pushed against the Chinese. So the Chinese were banned. And this is a wonderful uh, drawing here. The Gate of Golden Liberty, the only one barred out. It says, notice communist, nihilist, socialist, Fenian, and hoodlum welcome, but no admission to China. 
Now, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed for 10 years in 1882. It was renewed for another 10 years with more stringent uh, uh, categories in it, e.g. E Chinese needed to carry papers with them proving who they were at all times. It was then made permanent in 1902. It was not repealed until 1943. We'll get into why it was repealed. Let's look at this. This is San Francisco in 1906. The earthquake and fire. Let's get into an interesting story about people and race. That fire destroyed all the public records in San Francisco, the birth records. And so that opened a door for Chinese to bring in their, their children or paper children. They decided to devise somewhere where they could bring in children who had been born in the United States, gone back to China, bring them in or they could arrange to get relatives come in and essentially portray them as their paper sons. The point was the United States caught on to this and in the other Ellis Island that nobody knows about, Angel Island on the West Coast, that's where Chinese and other Asian immigrants were held and until they could prove that they were legitimately born in the United States, kept at bay. Let's look at some of the uh, walls. Angel Island is now a California National, uh, California Park, and inscribed in the walls where the Chinese were held are poems written in Chinese. This is the, this is the leavings of people who may not have been made, made it into the United States, who may have been sent back because of who they were. Let's look at the translations of several poems. Imprisoned in the wooden building day after day, my freedom withheld how can I bear to talk about it? I look at to see who is happy, but they only sit quietly. I'm anxious and depressed and cannot fall asleep. The days are long, the bottle constantly empty. My sad mood, even though it's not dispelled. These are the poems, the letters that they left on the walls. 1892, we opened a more efficient door, Ellis Island, which is now a museum to immigration. And that's a way to process people faster. Two years before the Columbian Exposition in, uh, actually it's four years before the Columbian Exposition in New Orleans, we're looking at the largest mass lynching in American history, 11 Italians. The Italians were accused of, of uh, the black hand, the mafia was accused of uh, assassinating the police chief in New Orleans. New Orleans, which had a large Italian population, which routinely referred to them as Dagos, a huge mob broke into the jail where the Italians, most of whom were probably innocent, were kept. Uh, they pulled them out, beat them to death, and hanged them on the street. Now, African Americans were being lynched at a much higher rate, but you will find Italian lynchings, you will find Jewish lynchings, you know, also in our history, not just numerous. Thomas Aldrich, the, the editor of Atlantic Magazine, gives his own version of American immigration 1895, and this plays a real racist game. Welcome open in our garden, stand our gates, and through them presses a wild, motley throng. Men from the Volga and Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Wang Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav. Fleeing the old world's poverty and scorn, these bringing with them unknown gods and rights, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws. In street and alley, what strange tongues and loud our loud accents of menace alien to our air. Voices that once the Tower of Babel knew, oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? And so in 1893, an organization is started in Boston called the Immigration Restriction League. They want to find a way to restrict immigration, the new immigration coming largely from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe. Uh, their goal is eventually to get a literacy act passed. That is, those people who were not literate in their own, their own language could not come to the United States. I love this cartoon, Danger to American Ideas and Institutions, Riff Raff Immigration. And you can see the image, all mustachioed turban floating up. It started by three Boston Brahmins, Charles Warren, Far Charles Prescott Far Farnsworth Hall, Charles Warren, Robert de Courcy Ward. Now they advocated the, the, uh, the Literacy Act because they did not want to completely stop the flow. They wanted to keep the flow in because it was necessary for industrial growth. 
And in, 19, in, in between 1907 and 1911, the US Congress, the House uh, creates a, uh, a Dillingham Commission. It's, it's uh, under uh, Congressman uh, Dillingham from Van, uh, Vermont. And they do a full multi-volume report on immigration to the United States. And they judge that the new immigration that is from Southern Central Eastern Europe is not the same, not as worthy as the old immigration. And they create this dictionary of races or peoples. To add to the chaos, uh, in 1901, a young man from Cleveland, Ohio, who was born to Polish family and deems himself an anarchist, assassinates President William McKinley in Buffalo, New York. And so the immigration laws are then changed to ban anarchists, saboteurs, epileptics, and professional beggars. Then there's a need for fuller control over naturalization, getting back to that. The Federal Division of Naturalization is created in 1906. Now, what it does to get naturalized before, it doesn't matter who you were, you simply went to any court in the land. And at election time in certain cities like New York, a lot of immigrants would turn up several days before election and thanks to the ward boss would be naturalized. So this was moved out of those courts and moved into federal district courts. Naturalization was merged with the Immigration Bureau in 1933, but they also start something here on, it's called Aliens Ineligible for Citizenship. This is complex. Because of the 14th and 15th amendments, people who were black, who were African, are deemed eligible for citizenship. But the question is, what about the colors in between, white and black? And so those become aliens ineligible for citizenship. Chinese cannot get citizenship even if, the, even if they come in. We begin to get Asian Indians coming in through Canada to the West Coast, and they too are prescribed from having citizenship. There's a noted case in the 1920s where one Asian Indian, a Sikh, takes his case all the way up to the major courts, arguing for his citizenship he brings in a racial expert who says Asian Indians are of the Aryan race and the court rules against him because they basically say when people see you on the street, they know you're not white. And so he loses his case. So Asian Indians, people who are Af Afghans, people of any color are really caught. And there's a minor immigration of them in the fact that they can come here but they can't get their citizenship. Now, if you're not Chinese, you can't come here. Then we do a gentleman's agreement in 1907 with Japan. Okay, we've outright banned Chinese coming and we violated a treaty in, uh, in 1882 treaty in doing that. Why do we get to a gentleman's agreement in Japan, from Japan where the Japanese take on the task of not allowing male workers to come to the United States? Because the Japanese in 1905 have shown themselves to be a world power. They defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. So we will toy with the Chinese, but we're really walking on eggshells with the Japanese. But nevertheless, we stop Japanese male immigration. And it's, it's critical. The literacy test comes up for, the, for Congress four different times. It's defeated in Congress once. It's passed in 1912. You can read this veto by President Taft. It's vetoed by President Wilson in 1915. In 1917, it is passed, it's wartime, it's passed over President Wilson's veto. So now if you cannot read a simple phrase in your own language, anybody over 16, you cannot be admitted to the United States. We'll see where that goes. But in 1917, we also imposed something called the Asiatic Bar Zone. And everything within that border is essentially where immigration is barred from except for diplomats, teachers, clerics, and other people of higher standing, and people who are coming only to visit. So we've essentially moved Asians out of immigration. This is a notorious book, 1915. It's called The Passing of the Great Race. It's written by Madison Grant. Grant was an amateur anthropologist, a Park Avenue bachelor from New York. This book sold perhaps five to 6,000 copies, but it fit into the tenor of the times. And I will read you several sections from this. 
The cross between a white man and an Indian is an Indian. The cross between a white man and a Negro is a Negro. The cross between a white man and a Hindu is a Hindu. The cross between any of the three European races, yes, is and a Jew is a Jew. And the other, the Native American is too proud to mix socially with them, is gradually withdrawn from the drawing from the scene, abandoning to these aliens the land which he conquered and developed. The man of the old stock is being crowded out of many country districts by these foreigners, just as he's today being literally driven off the streets of New York by the swarms of Polish Jews. And so this gets into a broader issue of not only race studies, but the beginning of eugenics selective breeding of people, stopping people who are deemed to be inferior from breeding. This, this rolls into the 1920s. This is 1924, 1923 or 1924, the Ku Klux Klan has a rally in Washington, DC. I think there are 20,000 Klan members who come from the entire United States there. They're parading down Pennsylvania Avenue Henry Ford is publishing a variantly anti-Semitic newspaper called the, baseball, the Peril of Baseball, Too Much Jew. So what we have in the 1920s is not only rising racism against people who are black, but Jews as well, and, and basically stop Catholics also. So we're, we're getting this mixture, and this leads to an incredibly restrictive act. The Emergency Quota Act, named after Alfred jo Albert Johnson, is passed in 1921. It basically says that only 3% of the citizens from a particular country counted the 1910 census can come in. That allows about 310,000 immigrants. And why did they do this? Well, immigration had literally staunched because of World War I. Then after the war, when the Literacy Act was in, immigrants began rolling in. And guess what? Most of the immigrants were literate it only stopped like 14,000 people from coming in. So they're looking at another way of stopping Southern and Eastern Europeans. Now, this one doesn't work as well as they wanted to. So they passed a second act in 1924 and they go back to the 1890 census. Now, why go back to the 1890 census? Because there are fewer people in the United States from Southern, Central and Eastern Europe and the percentage is less. And then 1929, they get into this complex national origins quota. They have tried to determine through generational uh, measurements how many people in the United States are German, British, Irish, Italian ancestry, and they apportion the quotas in that format. Let's see what the restrictions are. You can see the numbers there. So the, the red is North and Western Europe. You can see the numbers change. And it becomes largely Southern East Europe by 1910 begins to shift a little bit in 1920, but when, they, when those acts come in, it shifts basically the favor, favor people from Northern and Western Europe. And Blacks are living within this whole issue of increased racialization. Now, what about Mexico? The interesting thing is the Quota Act does not apply to the Western Hemisphere. There are probably two reasons it doesn't apply. A, because the Western Hemisphere is our hemisphere, or B, because farmers in the Southwest in California needed Mexicans to cross the border to do work. And so we're looking at an area Southwest in California that was originally part of Mexico. And within the cultural memory of people in Mexico, that was part of what they were. Mexican-American War, they take it from them. 1910, 1920 is a huge revolution in Mexico that puts millions of people in motion. The first, first original, official entry points, 1919. By the 1930s, Mexicans have moved into Gary, Indiana, into Chicago, into Detroit, even into Cleveland. And during the Depression, they are put on buses and trains and sent back to Mexico. But then in 1942, 1964, during the war, we need more workers where we go, we start the Bracero program, basically says, come across the border, work for us, take your money and go home. That goes on to 1964. And finally, with the 1965 act, which I'll get to, they put Western Hemisphere limits on it. So this, this is, if you're Mexican, you have to wonder, where am I? What's going on? End of national origins, the era of national origins, we're going to two things. It's in the era marked by depression, persecution, war, and ideological debate. And actually during the depression, 
immigration to cities like Cleveland drops, even the migration of African Americans to cities like Cleveland drop. But it will begin again during the war. Two pictures here. To the right is Albert Einstein, who had visited the United States several times, Jewish, probably the most brilliant physicist in the world. 1933, he sees Hitler coming to power. He's invited to the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. He comes there. He's admitted through a clause that allows noted scientists and noted figures to come to the United States. So he's in. The other ship is the motor, sh the other ship is the motor ship St. Louis. It's a German ship that which a you know, group of German Jews were on and they decided that they were going to come into the United States. They hadn't figured out a route. They would land in Cuba. And since Cuba was in the Western Hemisphere, they could come to the United States. They couldn't get in in any other way. When they got to Cuba, the Germans had basically set the whole thing up. Uh, they were not allowed to get visas to come to the United States. That ship sailed around the edge of the United States. Uh, the captain tried to save them and eventually settled, uh, sailed to, uh, to Belgium. It's a long story, but these pe many of these people were lost in the Holocaust because of who they were. After the war, and we're going to get into the closure of this talk, after the war, we're, we're looking at millions and millions of refugees in the world. And the question is, what will the United States do about that? We certainly didn't do much during the 1930s. During the war, when the Chinese are our allies in 1943, they become eligible for citizenship. Asian Indians during the anti-colonial period after the war become eligible for citizenship in 1946. And finally, in the mccarran Walter Act, which still keeps the quota system, anybody can become citizen. Okay, so we finally got rid of racialized citizenship, maybe. And what our response is to world full of refugees, and this is really important, is, is that displaced persons, we begin to resettle them, 202,000 are allowed into the United States, the Refugee Relief Act of 1953, 205,000. That's interesting because in 1953, they mortgaged those numbers against future quotas. So if you have 5,000, let's say uh, Latvians coming in, they'll mortgage it against their annual quota going on. We are very cool with people who are anti-communist. Uh, members of the Hungarian Revolution come in under presidential uh, pardon uh, from Eisenhower, Cuban refugees. Jackson Vanek Amendment allows Soviet Jews to come to the United States. In 1974, we do the right thing and allow about 175,000 Vietnamese refugees in. The sanctuary movement is an illegal movement on a border where people come in and they're held given sanctuary in, in various uh, churches. The Haitian Refugees Fairness Act, these are all Refugees. That's, you know, there are two things going on here. They're immigrants and they're refugees. Refugees are people who are forced out of their land and can't go any, can't go back, so they need a safe landing. A lot of people from Africa, Black Africans, have come to the United States from Ghana and Nigeria and other troubled areas in Africa. That, that has come under refugees. Uh, so that's what's happening. And then the golden door, Iron Curtain, this is one of the things I would always question, you know, do we return to our ideals or is this Cold War pragmatism? This is Jack Kennedy giving his famous speech in Berlin, Ich bin ein Berliner. So what we do in the middle 1960s is we pass the Civil Rights Law, we pass the Voting Rights Act, <laughs> yes, and we pass a major reform of American immigration, which basically does away with all the racialized prejudicial categories. And the question is, do we do that? Do we pass that immigration law to do the right thing? Or do we pass these laws? I like to be really teasing. It's because we're in an ideological war with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is working in old former colonial states and saying to people there, well, because of your skin color, you'd be lynched in the United States. You couldn't come to the United States. We can offer you a better deal. So what's going on in this change? This is a, Lyndon Johnson signed the new immigration law, the Hart Seller Act in 1965 at the uh, Liberty Island. He said people would never, no, never, uh, this would be a minor act. People will never see much change coming from it. Boy, was he wrong. What they expected in the Hart Seller Act, which became um, active in 1967, was a renewal of immigration from Europe. 
And many of the congressmen who voted for this act were descendants of those who had come from Europe. And they felt that this was a way to reunite your family. And, and thanks to Michael Fee and a congressman from Cleveland, the largest quota for people coming in were people who were reuniting families. And so for the first several years, the flow of immigrants was from Europe. But subsequent to that, it has been from other parts of the globe. China, the Middle East, Africa, the entire globe is in motion. And that has changed the imaging of America. It's changed who we are, if you want to look at it as a formerly Anglo city uh, community. And it's the same thing as changed Cleveland. So, so if we're looking at the, these are the laws and I won't go through them in detail. Uh, Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, these are the numbers. Refugee Act 1980, which is separate, they pull refugees out of immigration. 86 Immigration and Control Act, this was trying to deal with quote unquote undocumented or illegal immigrants. 1990, the diversity lottery, huh? Say what's the diversity lottery? Well, that started with the Irish because many of the Irish couldn't come over because they didn't have, the, one of the major factors among the seven criteria to come in under the new act was having a job skill that no American had or could provide. And so in the early years of the act, many Irish couldn't come in because they were too far away from a family. The family wasn't a parent in the United States. So they began coming over illegally. And, and this was passed, this law was passed by Dan Rost, it was posed by Dan Rostenkowski. And essentially it gave the Irish, they could take, there would be a lottery and they could win a visa to the United States. That eventually was extended to countries that were not being represented in the flow into the United States. Now, the question you have to ask, is that to give them equity with everybody else, or is that to balance off the flow that's coming from other areas of the world? Is that to engineer what America looks like? That's my, you know, some thoughts here. So where are we today? Where were we yesterday? We have an incredibly diverse immigration pattern. We still have issues of race and color and language. This is the border in 2018. To give you a picture of the border today, people are attempting to come in. Uh, they're fleeing whatever they're fleeing, poverty, crime. They're looking for a new chance in the United States. The question is, what do we do? How do we characterize these people? As, as someone characterized them in the uh, election campaign prior to the last one, as thugs, murderers, and rapists, how do we look at people because they're from different areas that are not our area that our ancestry comes from? That's what, is, that's what we're struggling with still today. Changes and Challenge, I'll stop with this one. This is an older book by two Clevelanders, Richard Herman and Robert L. Smith. Uh, Bob Smith was a columnist for the United, for a plain dealer, and Richard Herman is an immigration lawyer. And they're talking about why immigrant entrepreneurs are driving the new economy. You notice the hands raised are a variety of colors there. And then these are the picture to your right are the sample border walls that were uh, put up during the previous administration. So the question I would have is, how, who gets admitted now? How do we get admitted? We got rid of the Muslim nation ban just re recently. How do we look at people? Do we look at them because of their skin color, their quote unquote race? How do we determine what that race is? Where do Africans stand? Where do black Americans stand in all of this? Where do the events of the last several months, last year, stand in how we're going to look at our community and our nation as we go forward. It may not be simply an issue of black and white when we look at race and immigration. It is a simple, it is something of othering people and othering them because maybe of their religion or maybe because of their skin color or maybe because of their diet or whatever else that's still with us. The only thing that makes it somewhat hopeful is that 1965 immigration law is still in force. So I think I have shot my wad and it's time to get to uh, questions here. Thank you. That should be the last image, yes. Dr. Goreski, thank you so much. Um, and we have had a few questions come in. Okay. So to start, 
Can you describe the migration of African Americans to Cleveland following the Civil War and the role Cleveland played in the Underground Railroad? Well, Cleveland's role in the Underground Railroad really goes back to the early years of Cleveland. And part of that is, is due to the fact that Cleveland was largely initiated in New England town. And, and a good percentage of it uh, was Presbyterian and Congregationalist. And the ideals of that church drifted over with them. They were not necessarily abolitionists. Many of them were against slavery. Some of them would probably have been in favor of colonization, that is free, Afri free African slaves and send them back to Africa. Now, these are people who had been here for generations. Uh, but we know there was a strong force in the Underground Railroad. There's just been a new interpretive center open in the Cozad Bates House uh, on the university campus. Uh, we know that there were 800 free people of Cleveland of color in Cleveland at the time of the beginning of the Civil War. And we know that after the Civil War, migration of African Americans continued up into Cleveland. And it began to grow substantially in the 1890s, but particularly it grew in the 1910s, uh, the 19, uh, 1910s, when the United States went to war, jobs could not be filled by immigrants who were not coming over. And so Migrants were wanted here, uh, Appalachians and, and African Americans. The number goes from 9,000 to 35,000. So that's that movement. It is staunch, like almost every other movement by the Depression. The greatest movement, though, is during the Second World War, in, in which uh, the, the great migration really comes up to cities like Cleveland and Detroit, Chicago. Now, that's not a peaceful movement. It wasn't a peaceful movement in Chicago in 1919, a huge race riot, race riots in Detroit in the, during, the, during the Second World War. Cleveland avoided that, supposedly. Yet it always tested the inclusivity of the city. OK, next question. Sure. So as you think about the various eras of immigration policy throughout history, which one has seemingly impacted the current landscape of Cleveland most? It, it has been the recent policy. Of, it has been the 1965 policy. Uh, we, we tend, and myself, I tend to look at Cleveland as an Ellis Island city uh, because that was the great industrial period. It was an Ellis Island and a black city, but it has shifted since then. Uh, and our percentage of foreign born is quite small. It's like five to 6% right now. Uh, but we're looking at migration patterns. You can see it on the college campus. You can see it in the refugee communities in Cleveland from places that are not in Europe. Some places are in Europe but places from around the globe. So the global movement is here. And I think we need to realize that people migrate. And I usually say that people have been migrating ever since Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. And the people migrate because there's a push factor to get them out. It could be economics, it can be prejudice, it can be, it can be war. And then they need a pull factor. They need some place to go where they'll be safe or where they can make a better living. And the argument now is that we need more diverse skills in Cleveland. And, and I would say that runs into another issue that, that people with high skill sets are very valued in part of the new economy. And the question is, what are those people who are coming in as refugees who don't have the skill sets? Where do they end up in the new economy? Uh, do you meet them in your hotel room when they make the bed for you? Do you see them on the uh, on the floor of the hospital, where they're doing cleanup or pushing a gurney, what jobs do they get? And then when they get those lower level jobs, who jobs, quote, do they, do they imperil? So there's an argument that goes on about this, to be frank about it. Uh, so it is, it is a more diverse city. Greater Cleveland has over 100, perhaps 100 different ethnic groups in it, minor res representation. So it has almost every religion on the face of the earth at this point. Uh, but it, it is, you know, it, the percentage of people who are foreign born is much smaller than it ever was in the city. So as we look throughout history, the mishandling of immigration policy really has been a legacy in the United States. How can we change this? Is it policy and or changing people's opinions of immigrants? I think it's the latter. I think we need to change people's opinions of immigrants. Uh, two, we, we, we need to see them as human beings equal to ourselves. And three, we have to start, secondly, I think we have to stop looking at how much they're going to give to the economy. I think that's one of my arguments. I, you know, I, I may seem like an anti-capitalist here, but if we welcome people because they will do work for us and enrich the economy, that's fine. But should that be the only reason? 
we've seen that again and again. I mean, that's, you know, that's people from elsewhere, whether enslaved or not, built this country. And people from elsewhere built the industrial community. Uh, the, the point is when people from elsewhere come and they don't have a skill set, do we go back to those statements I had in my first or second slide? The great renovator of the world, do we bring them in? And that's, that's a matter of educating ourselves. It's a matter of educating people, not only about skin color, but about culture, about food ways, about religion, about the way people celebrate holidays. You know, we, we need to fold in almost all of these, these celebrations. It sounds difficult. You know, we, we, we were a Christian country. We rebranded ourselves as a Judeo-Christian country. After 9-11, it's really hard to fit in Muslims. It's been a problem. It's still problematic. So looking back, how many Africans were in the US before 1808 and then looking at 1865? Okay, I don't know the figures in 1865. I, I know the, the number of Africans in 1890, I, the population of the United States was just about 5 million, was about 18%. The number of people who identify as African in today's census, I think is like 12.3%. Uh, Civil War, I think it's still gonna be that higher percentage. Uh, the usual figure that's thrown out, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm free forming here, is, is that uh, the bulk of African-American people at that point were in the South. And that began to shift with the Great Migration to the North. Uh, Cleveland, as I mentioned, occasioned a huge influx of African-Americans. And I would dare say here that there's some historical studies that say one of the reasons that people pushed for uh, quota acts against Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe is that, that some of the business people saw, well, it may, we may lose our immigrant laborers, but we've got laborers coming in from Appalachia and laborers coming in from the deep south. And, and one of the statements I've heard, and this I hate to say, is it more docile? Uh, so there, there are just a lot of nastiness in all of this. And I don't want to say it's all nasty, but it's, it, it really is. Who, you know, if, if, you're, if you're making your product, how do you make it cheapest? What, where's your labor cost? Why have the factories gone to Asia? Why do we buy things from China? I'm sorry, that's a, that's a different lecture. <laughs> so as those of us on the call want to continue to expand our knowledge and continue to learn, where are the good resources? How do we continue to stay aware of immigration policy and the things that are happening? I should send you a book list. I can't name all the books for you. There, there's a lot of material happening. Uh, Roger Daniels book, Coming to America, is a little old, uh, but it is, it's, it's, it's written in a very, very good style. Uh, my colleague, uh, John Flores, at Case Western Reserve University would be the best person. I will ask John for his recommendations. But John deals with Latino, Latinx immigration. He's done a major book on uh, Mexicans in Chicago. But John's, John's field is race. He teaches all of our courses on race at the, store, at the university. And so I will check with John on some of the latest books for you. And I'll get those through you, Rachel, and then you can distribute them to whoever is here. But there's a lot of literature coming out. There's a good book. It's an older book called uh, Still the Golden Door. It's by a man named David Reimers. And he talks about the shift in immigration from basically European to global immigration after that new immigration law. Uh, there are many articles online about refugee and refugee policy. And if you'll recall, and I don't want to keep you here all day, but you know, the, uh, during the previous administration, we basically cut down the number of refugees coming into the United States to nearly zero, if not zero. And then under the current administration, it was cut back to 18,000, and then there was a quick turnaround on that. There was an outcry about doing that. Uh, and, and so that's one of the things we have to look at is, is that refugees are not only created by war and persecution, they're created by global warming. And, and as agricultural systems around the world shift, as, as the weather gets too bad to grow crops, more people are going to be in motion than ever before. And it's simply not going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be a global push. 
heard many people see, say that, and I, I, I fully recognize that. Uh, we'll see things, we'll, we'll see migration patterns coming out of all continents. Surprise, some Canadians are nice and not a joke, but the heat in Canada right now is just unbearable. You know, whether that's global warming or not, we cannot say, but these are the changes we have to look at. And people will, will you know, people are people. When they need to move, they will move. They will knock at the door, they will push the door open. And they're all people like us. Well, Dr. Grabowski, we thank you for your time today. Um, I'm going to echo a few of the comments in the chat that this was an amazing overview in 60 minutes. And I'm sure we would all be very excited to take a year long Cleveland history class from mm -hmm. you to learn even more. So thank you. And we will be sharing the slides today and um, additional follow up with books and additional resources. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn it back to Marianne. Man, my pleasure. Great, Everybody knows where to find me. Uh, it's, it's the University of Historical Society. Shoot me an email. Agree with me, disagree with me, ask me for advice. I'm, I'm fine and dandy with that. Oh, thanks so much for that kind offer, Dr. Grabowski. This has been such an important reminder that we need to understand and confront our past so that we can build our future.